I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Taylor Sparks. I'm an associate professor, hopefully not for long, up for full professor. Pretty excited about that here at the University of Utah uh, in the material science and engineering department. And, uh, you know, as always, I'm joined by my trusty co-host, Andrew, how are you? Doing well, doing well. It's uh, it's a fall morning, or I guess afternoon at this point. It was supposed to be a fall morning, but... Yeah, we were supposed to record this morning, but your humble correspondent was rear-ended, but I'm still alive, folks. They tried to take me out. They couldn't do it. Yeah, we have a variety of competitors who are interested in the downfall <laughs> of this podcast. <laughs> yeah, but we are also joined today by uh, Eric Ironman. Eric, you've been on this show before. What brings you to Salt Lake City? Well, I, thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me back. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're here because we're actually refurbishing a uh, spark plasma sintering unit here at, uh, at Utah. And uh, it's Who better to do it. Yeah. You guys know the ins and outs of that. How many different uh, manufacturer instruments do you guys have over there? Uh, so we have, we have two instruments at our facility, and then we've done installs or servicing for a couple dozen. Oh, heck yeah. That's yeah. great. So we figured while he's in town, we ought to do another episode. And uh, when, when we were brainstorming what to talk about, something that rose right to the top of our mind is cryo milling. And before you talk about cryo milling, whatever that is, we have to describe milling in general. So today's episode is going to be a more of an introductory episode on milling um, and probably as it relates to SPS because we've got the guru here. Um, but then we'll talk about cryo milling as a special type. Now, as we were just putting this episode together, there's going to be more. We realize there's a lot more deep dives, so stay tuned. There will probably be a further episode on this. But for today, let's dive into milling. So why on earth do we use mills, and what are we interested in doing in material science when we're putting things inside of these mills? A lot of it comes down to powder size reduction. A lot of ceramic especially, but even now metals as well, rely on you getting as fine a powder as possible so that when you press it together, you can achieve a, a high density. If you have large particles, think about you know trying to push several tennis balls together. There's going to be a void space there, yeah. but all of a sudden you go to golf balls, and now that void space is smaller. You go to marbles, and you can imagine that now on a micron size scale as well. Yeah, bingo. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to this. <laughs> I'd say that most people in material science, uh, when they get involved in it, it's probably with like some clunky old machine. I, I can still remember. Actually, my first one I used, it was when I was working at Ceramitech 25 years ago almost. And uh, it was a paint shaker. <laughs> they had a paint shaker mounted to the floor. And you would put a Nalgene bottle inside of there with, we were doing slip casting. So I would put all my stuff to make my slip. Oh, yeah. It was sort of like a mud, right? And into the mud goes a bunch of really hard ceramic particles you screw that lid on. You can't have it totally full. It's like half to three quarters full. You put it in the paint shaker. It just goes nuts for like an hour. They put it in like a sound damping box because it's so loud. You come back and your your stuff is totally different. It has different rheological characteristics. It's hopefully it's going to have fewer, you know, agglomerates and flaw causing defects in your material um, through this process. But that's a pretty clunky. There's much more sophisticated ways to go about mixing your materials. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, more, the most common one that you'll see is just a, maybe a conventional ball mill um, where you just have a cylinder that's going to contain all your powder as well as giant media that are spherical, the balls. And so this just rotates at a very slow RPM and just causes the balls to slowly fall on top of one another. And at those impact sites, you're going to crush the powder and, and slowly make it smaller and smaller. And you could these can go as small as just like a Nalgene bottle, like you're saying, just on two little rollers. Or big drums. Or huge drums the, that yeah. fill like an entire room where you need hearing protection oh, to totally. be around them because they're just so loud. The key word that you said there, in my view, is slow, right? It will slowly mill these things because you're relying on like this cascading effect of the media. I'm moving my hands as you can see, as if you could see, right? But the media falls down, and if there's a particle between the two media types, it's going to fall down and sort of crash it. That's what you're relying on. Yep. So that takes forever if this thing is rolling at really these low speeds. Um, you can do this wet, you can do this dry. There's sort of pros and cons to both, but it's a slow process. And it has to be slow. I mean, if you go faster, all of a sudden you're going to have 
centripetal force is just holding yeah. the, the media to There's the no sides falling, of the right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you go too fast, then it's throwing them and your chances of them falling on one another. So it's a tried and true method, but uh, it scales. industry can't wait. Yeah. It's low, low cost and it scales. But if you really want to reduce your particle size, what other options do we have? What else do we have, Eric? Yeah, so you have, uh, you know, more high energy ball milling. So Like planetary mills? Planetary mills. That's a big one. Uh, how, how do those so work? What's the difference between that and the roller mill that you might have seen before? So it's a lot higher speed. So it's uh, it's basically your same same idea, except you're doing it uh, on a, in a vertical basis. So uh-huh. you're putting media in, you're putting your material in, could be dry, could be in a solvent, could be anything, but you're rotating it up to 1,000 RPM at a time. And much higher energy means much faster particle size reduction and uh, just really in- increase the, the cycle, uh, you know, the lower the cycle time. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, they, so the, the containers holding your media and your powder are rotating in one direction and they're on their own plate sort of orbiting a center as well, right? Yeah, that's well, So the, the G-forces, if you will, so are the G pretty forces. dramatic. So like they, you know, because of how the, the forces end up lining up, your powder is getting stuck to the wall and then the media are being slammed at high velocity into it. And so it's just a constant barrage. Yeah. So you just can, you know, break it at a much faster speed. But good luck scaling that up. I was just gonna say. I was just yeah. gonna say. I'd used one of these, and it's fine if you're making a kilogram at a time. Even that kilogram is pretty big, right? Um, small scale, it's not a big deal. We actually, for a grant from, we had a LDRD. That's a type of grant from Idaho National Laboratory, where basically they came to the university to do a portion of the work that they needed done. And we needed to make a bunch of alloys, and we needed to mill them because we were mixing. These were high entropy alloys, right? flavor of the week right now in materials. And we had to mix a bunch of things. So you definitely have to mill it. They, you can't have, you know, you know, a, a cobalt rich region and an iron rich region. We really want to mix these things together. And uh, the small mill that we had wasn't cutting it. So we bought the big one, which was a lot of money. And it still is not that big. Like you're still talking about like half liter sizes, right? So yeah. planetary mill is great for what it is, but it's gonna be hard for big corporations to scale that. Fortunately, there's other options out there. Yeah, and the, the the next one up is really the attrition milling. So Bingo. that's the that's the one where your your vessel isn't uh, isn't moving, uh, but it's actually a shaft with arms, and then that's what rotates and spins your media and your material inside, and that's a highly scalable process. Yeah. Yeah. Picture like if you've ever seen uh, like at Home Depot when you mix your own paint. There's like a little mixer or like an immersion blender. This is basically like an immersion blender, right? You take this, you dip it into the material, which is going to have your ceramic particles plus the media, and it's going to mix it. And obviously, you're not, you're not relying on the blade of the mixer chopping it. These are You're still relying on the ceramic particles colliding, but you're agitating that with a, a large mixer, basically. There's ultrasonic versions of this. There's, you know, now, you, now it's typically going to be fluid-based. And so now you introduce ideas like which is your solvent, what's your flow rate look like, there's still a lot of tunable parameters there, but in general, the scales, because you can have a big reservoir of your slurry, and then it can be passed through the region where the actual ball mills are kept and where the, the particle size reduction is taking place. Yeah, yeah, and you can jacket it so you can keep it so it's cool as you're scaling too, so that's a big thing if you want to keep heat down the process. Um, but then here at Cal Nano, we, we take that to the next level. So we do what's called cryo milling, and so that's high energy attrition milling, but at cryogenic temperatures. And so we're actually introducing liquid nitrogen or liquid argon into the milling process as the medium. And that gives you a whole host oh, yeah. of different uh, benefits and kind of process that you can do there. Now, listeners might be wondering like, why on earth complicate this further by adding liquid nitrogen? Like that just sounds like a whole nother can of worms. There's a good reason for it. Uh, I remember my first exposure to this, I was trying to make magnesium silicide from magnesium metal, which turns out is will catch fire, right? Especially when it's very small particle size, like ignorant me, like not knowing this, um, and silicon. But when we tried to mill this stuff together, first off, it got so hot in there when we were done that when we opened it, it did cause a small fire. I think, heavens, we were dealing with very small amounts, right? Because it actually oxidized spontaneously. Um, but the other problem we found out is that it wasn't even actually forming the compound we wanted because the magnesium is a super ductile metal and it was accumulating in like the corners of, the, of our planetary ball mill and it wasn't actually even forming the compound we wanted, which was really frustrating. We had this happen to us again on the High Entropy Alloy Project, which is when, that might have been the first time that we met Eric, uh, I, I, we needing somebody to help us mill this and having heard about cryo milling, we reached out to Eric and lo and behold, this technique was fantastic. It was able to take a five component and sometimes more mixture of transition metals. And even though some of those are ductile, some are not, it was able to mix them really nicely using cryo milling. So what's the magic of this? What's actually going on there? 
Yeah. So, I mean, like, like you mentioned, we're taking multiple elements, five plus materials and combining them into the, into the cryo mill. And I think, you know, the magic is obviously in the, the cryogenic liquid and just how, uh, how the cold and you're, you're keeping it cold the entire time and that, that cold working, um, and the, the aspect of, uh, combining the materials, whether it's ductile, whether it's hard phase materials, you know, it could be ceramics with metals, all those different things. And, uh, and putting it in there and being able to alloy it in like it's a matter of a couple hours, we're able to take it from the raw elementals into the, uh, the final homogeneous, fully mechanically alloyed material. So let me jump in and say a few words to cut this, Jared. Uh, do you want to talk about like ductile, ductile libido transition? Do you want to talk about recovery, regrowth, grain, recovery, recrystallization, grain growth, how this is low temperature where we're avoiding those things? Yeah, maybe just the ductile brittle transition at least. Okay. Just be like, um, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. With uh, ceramic particles, you can just rely on their brittleness. You know that when right. these two, the media comes into contact with them, they're going to fracture. But with a metal like you, in your experience, Taylor, you know, it's ductile, so it might just flatten them, which maybe in some cases is what you want. But if you're trying to do uh, particle size reduction, that's not really what you're trying to do. And so taking it down to temperature, you pass through the, the ductile brittle sort of transition point to the point where these metal particles are now going to start behaving in a brittle fashion, and you're actually going to be able to achieve that particle size reduction as well as I think also lowering that temperature is also going to reduce the effects of um, various temperature related reactions as well is that right yeah that's correct yeah so you're you're reducing all those uh, any sort of heat that's being introduced to the system is going to cause different chemical reactions different things that can not always be advantageous to the process and so keeping it so cold creates that along with uh, grain refinement which is something that we haven't touched on but with metallics it's also uh, really good to get nanostructured materials within the uh, within the process, and that can have a host of benefits when it comes to strength improvements, when it comes to, um, you know, other chemical or material improvements. And so um, that's that's what we do with those as well. Very cool. Yeah, with the, uh, with the reduction of these, uh, these grains and creating these nanocrystalline structures, you want to be able to retain that. And so that's where our other technology we have, SPS, Oh, yeah. Comes into play. Hand in glove, man. Yeah. And so we're able to center at just incredible speeds and lower temperatures, and that just keeps the grains at the, you know, basically the size that you milled them down to, uh, and that keeps your strength properties. First, you did it with a traditional sintering process, you know, hipping or uh, furnace, and those grains grow. You lose all your properties. Sometimes when, I, when I've, you know, taught like the lab class here in our department, I tell the students, you know, you need to include a milling step for mixing and to reduce the particle size. And they sort of naively think like, oh, I'll just mill it down to one micron as if to like somehow magically there's a number and all your particles are going to be nice and evenly sized one micron. That's totally not how it goes, right? If you mill the stuff and then you took and you took that media out, you put it in a particle size analyzer or a microscope or something where you can analyze the size, what you're going to see is a distribution, right? It's probably going to be a log normal distribution where you have a larger volume of what you call your fines, right? The stuff that is smaller than maybe what you're after, and then a smaller volume of your larger particles. So what do you do with that distribution? Um, I'll tell you what I saw at Ceramitech is there were stacks of sieves. You'd put like six different sieves on top of each other in a vibrating shaking table that would be tapped on the top. You'd put all of your stuff from the milling process into the top, and it would cascade from large sieve openings down to the smallest. So you get this segregation and separation of the different particle sizes, which still within their different bins is still going to have a distribution, but it'll at least start to give you um, some homogeneous uh, particle size. Yeah, there's like air classification methods as well. Oh, you're right. Um, but yeah, no, you, just because you, you don't really have a, a full control about uh, over, in one of those traditional media milling processes, you're not going to have full control of the, the powder size that it comes out. Exactly. Yeah, you get a pretty wide distribution. Looks at you looking at your particle size curve that you're you're gonna get. So sieving's a great process to be able to narrow that down. Uh, but actually, with SPS, we don't even need that. So we can just take the full batch of the. You don't you don't follow it with the sieving, huh? We don't need it sieve. No, because you we don't can do take, like a spray pyrolysis or a um, spray drying or anything. Nope. No, not with SPS. So we can take that whole batch of powder, center it, and actually. The, the good thing about it is when, you know, if you're imagining when you're, you're sintering, you know, if you have, like you mentioned, the tennis ball, like yeah. uh, if you're trying to center those all together, it takes a lot more energy to be able to get those to consolidate versus if you have tennis balls with basketballs, with baseballs, with golf balls. You guys like the distribution. We like the distribution be able to center it actually typically but lower What about like die wall friction? So normally when you do this particle size reduction, 
they'll then actually go up again slightly with spray drying, right? Spray drying is you take these particles, which have now been reduced, and you're going to spherilize them, right? It, so you're going to make them nice and spherical. It does go up in size because you are agglomerating things a little bit. But the point is that you get nice flowing powder, right? These spheres flow nicely, so you get rid of die wall friction. It gets rid of gradients in the density in your pressed ceramic. It's, there's a lot of advantages to it. It's your chance to add binder and things like that intimately into it, which, again, maybe isn't always the case with metals, but I'm surprised that skipping that step entirely doesn't lead to bigger problems, especially because I know you guys make big components. Uh, as we talked about in our last episode, you guys were able to press some really big stuff over there. Yeah, it just it, it, you definitely can see some benefits if you want to spherize it for for flowability, um, but it's really a test of a specific material. So if you're having a material that particularly flows really bad once you get it down to that, that nanoparticle size, then using a process like that is going to be you know needed. But a lot of times we, as long as it can can get in and, and get into a dye, and you can um, if, you it's know, not, if it's not broken, if it's, don't yeah, add a step. Don't that add a step great. if you don't need to. Right, so. That's, that's exactly what, kind of what we do. So. And and then you don't have to try to filter for whether you're getting that um, nanograin structure. Do you have to do any sort of characterization of that, or is it that homogenous as well? That's homogenous as well. So we've we've done some characterization over the uh, course of, you know, many different projects and, mm-hmm. and showing that it, it's homogenous throughout the entire process. And that includes if you mix in ceramics, so taking, taking metals and mixing them in to make these uh, MMC materials, metal matrix composites, you can... You can create a fully homogenous. You see the ceramic kind of aligned all together with that. So that's a, that's a big part of crime milling too. And that falls a little bit into mechanical alloying, right? Yeah, can that's you talk correct. a little bit about that? So yeah, that's that's kind of the 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 point of when we're talking about taking these elemental materials together and combining them. Is that's what that's what's happening? So it's mechanical alloying of let's say you're taking an aluminum, a titanium. Uh, tungsten, niobium, all these different materials, you can combine them and make a, you know, fully homogenous, mechanically alloyed part. Um, and we've done this with, like I said, uh, aerospace alloys. So we've we've taken that, we've combined it with a ceramic and other metals, and then we've been able to increase the strength by two, three times uh, through the crumbling process. So Eric, this sounds awesome. Um, where you are doing this as a service for people, I imagine you have some really cool case studies to talk about. Where are you seeing this being used and what sort of exciting things is it making possible? Yeah, so one of the one of the cool ones that we did a, a few years ago was we made this uh, this customized magnesium alloy uh, that actually tested as the world strength world record in terms of compression strength of, of any material. So what what's what's so special? Why did it do that? Uh, it's basically from the the grain refinement we get. So we combine the magnesium with the, Couple of special sauce uh, things sure, yeah. you can mention. Some magic chemistry, uh, yeah. but, but it's also the milling process you're yeah, saying. The milling process, the crab milling process specifically, that reduced that grain structure to such a such a small nanograin that it, it prevented the basically the crack propagation that would occur in a you know a s- larger size uh, you know grain material, um, and that is what then combining that with the SPS to keep that limit that yep. grain growth, then made it so it was the you know. The, the highest compression strength material. Uh, who it was with uh, uh, University of uh, California Riverside. Oh, there yeah, UCR. What professor uh, Suvine, and then and then another one actually more on the the particle size reduction uh, that we're working on. It's actually with a material for uh, carbon sequestering. So it's a material that is starting off in these kind of large beads, and uh, and they want to increase the surface area. Um, in order to have uh, additional carbon uh, absorption during their their process, and so. They were trying to find a different way to do it. They, they couldn't have it where it had any sort of heat be, be put in because it yeah, completely degrades the sense. material. And so we did it with cryo milling, worked like a charm, like reduce the particle size. They get improved properties and off to the races. Going back, we were having a conversation prior to recording this. You had mentioned that with cryo milling, there's also a really nice feature where you can perform the mechanical alloying process without affecting your particle size. How does that work? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So. Uh, what you're doing there is essentially um, you can put in different process control agents where you're kind of balancing the combination of the fracture fracturing the material versus the the cold working and welding, and so you get uh, you get a flattening. So it it will take it from let's say a spherical powders to it starts to put in that work and flatten, and then it reagglomerates. And so what you end up with is a kind of irregular shaped uh, like platelet like material. Um, and that has some benefits because you're not having to handle 
uh, like we talked about nanomaterials, which maybe can't flow as well, or they're just, just more difficult for people to handle. And so if you have all the benefits of getting the nano structure of it, but you have a particle size that's already, that, that's larger, you don't have to go through that sphere adjacent step. You don't have to do any of that. And you can just get the, get the benefits of the, the cryomilling to get a nano crystalline structure. It's pretty cool. So you're able to, you are deforming the material. So essentially you're keeping your particle size, but your total volume of material is decreasing. Yeah, that's correct. Yep. It's pretty rad. <laughs> pretty good yeah. rad technique. So, I mean, so far we've talked about, you know, the, the basics of milling, why you might care about it. Uh, some of the popular ways out there, but what we haven't talked about and what I think is worth discussing a little bit are some of the drawbacks to it, right? As in most things in material science, there's always trade-offs, right? So what are the trade-offs that we have in exchange for getting this reduction in particle size? I mean, to do that, right, you're, you have media that are going to be involved, and that, that wears too. You're, you're, you <laughs> yep. know, you're crushing powders, but the media is the one actually doing it. And usually, if you're doing ceramics or even metals, you know, there's going to be a hardness differential there and your media might actually start to degrade too and depending on what that media is you might introduce contaminants yeah you can see it i've actually seen x-ray diffraction studies where it was the whole point of the study was to show that x-ray diffraction is quantitative it can give you phase fractions and the the case study that they showed it was in milling time right they took whatever the media was that they were milling but they added i think it was alumina media and they showed that the alumina peaks one hour versus 10 hours versus, you know, a week or just climbing, like the volume fraction of that milling media, which is also getting ground up, is showing up in your sample. Maybe you're okay with that. Like maybe your, your process is tolerant to a couple of weight percent of impurities and maybe it's not, right? But it's something that you need to be aware of. And it spans a lot of things. Like it could be chemical impurities, but it could also be an aesthetic impurity too. Like a yeah. lot of powders that are used in dyes also go through a milling process and sometimes the media actually wears off and will change the color of those dyes. But... You know, that ends up, depending on what your process is, that purity can make a huge difference. Like, I think silicon nitride is the, is the case study here, yeah. where they first tried to make it, and they couldn't get the theoretical properties because of small trace impurities that were almost beyond de the detectable limit. Oh, yeah. And what they ended up having to do was, you know, you first you send it through, you make then some silicon nitride media, and you start using that, and then you make yeah. you know, that next batch yeah, is your yeah. new silicon nitride media, and all of a sudden you slowly start working out those impurities. So you can order, good news is that you can't order a bunch of different types of medias of different sizes and shapes. Oh gosh, we, on our future episode, we're going to have to get into that. But there's tungsten carbide, there's alumina, there's zirconia, there's silicon nitride. There's a bunch out there to choose from. And in general, the, the faster milling times are going to come with your more dense media, right? So I know that in our lab, we've often used tungsten carbide media, which is not cheap. And it's better if you have a tungsten carbide, you know, uh, the container, right? But these are not cheap to buy. Um, but that higher density just really increases our milling time, which is something that we've enjoyed in the past. But you still see the tungsten carbide left over in your um, signal it, afterwards. It's almost That's inevitable yeah. Yeah, to see some sort of small contamination. I imagine you get some cobalt too. Yep. Oh, yeah, because it's not pure. It's not the pure ceramic, right? Yep. You want the toughness, and so they add a little bit of cobalt there. And there are methods. You know, like jet milling has become really popular in these high-purity applications where – Something we'll have to discuss on a future episode in more yeah. detail, but using yeah, compressed air, you basically circulate the powder in a chamber and you allow particle-particle interactions oh, to crush cool. them. So there's no, no media involved, so it's just, uh, just straight particle-particle. So yeah, like you said, for high purity, it's, it's very beneficial because you have no contaminants that are being introduced. And you automatically filter by size, too, because it creates a vortex, so... Larger particles are going to have more drag. They're going to stay towards the edge. But once they get small enough, they can escape the vortex and enter out a chute. And so by controlling those speeds, you can control what powder size actually makes Oh, that's makes cool. It so it's a, it's a separator and a particle size reduction in one. Yeah, you can yeah. get some very narrow um, high purity distributions. I did see one way around this problem of impurities. When I was at Ceramitech, we were working on ceramics, which are pretty robust chemically. And they use steel milling media, right? Because the steel filings, they could just do an acid wash. Ceramic was pretty much unaffected. I think we were working on a YSC at the time. Mm -hmm. And the you could dissolve away the other impurities. So I guess there's some clever ways around it. And steel is kind of a high, nice high-density material anyways. Yeah, in crown milling, we, we primarily use stainless steel. For, oh, really? For media. For is it mostly for cost or for the toughness? Uh, it's, for, it's for cost. It's for uh, the fact that when you're putting stuff down in cryogenic temperatures... Uh, putting in a ceramic media is uh, is going to brittle, and then that media is just going to break up on you. Mm. So using stainless steel is really the way to go. And then and then yeah, you get you get potentially some uh, minor amount of contamination, but 
uh, like you said, there's different ways to kind of to mitigate that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, when we're what we've seen when we're doing our cry milling, um, which I can't speak to exactly how it affects on uh, different milling processes, but we we actually get a, a powder coating that goes on the the media and the shaft uh, of the of the mill. And so what happens is we do what's called a break and run, which coats everything. We remove that, then we put in our actual powder that we want to mill. And basically, what you're getting whenever something breaks off, it's just a coating of that actual material. Oh, how clever! So, so that just keeps going. And so basically, what what happens is you anything that's breaking off is just the actual coating of the break in material. We call at it. least the same chemistry. Yeah, so it is a very similar chemistry, which really minimizes your amount of contamination. That's a good idea. Well, um, what about costs? Tell me a little bit about the cost of these competing techniques. I know that students that have used the roller mills know that those cost basically nothing. Um, ball mills versus attrition mills versus cryo milling. What are the costs of the equipment? What are the qu- costs of used as a service? How, how expensive is this process? So, yeah, when it comes to uh, attrition mills, uh, I mean, the, the basic, you know, models are pretty pretty straightforward. It's, it's a vessel, it's a shaft. So, I mean, depends on how you're outfitting it. But, you know, in the, you know, small ones being in the, little under a hundred thousand to scaling up for there to hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for really large vessels. Uh, and when it comes to cryo milling, the big cost is really in the processing. So it's in the, the, uh, liquid, nitrogen, the liquid nitrogen consumption. Um, but at Count Anna, we actually have a patent in place for, for high volume cost effective uh, cryo milling. Where you're just basically, I, mean, I imagine it's about it's, reducing your heat, right? Transfer. Yeah. And it's just, it's a, we can talk about recirculating the liquid nitrogen uh, in order to Kind of cut costs down there, uh, so that's a that's a big part of it that we're looking to as we're looking to scale up. Yeah. yeah so one of the advantages I think of cryo milling as well, or even just the mechanical alloying process, is you are essentially cold working these materials, and you're doing a lot of damage, getting lots <laughs> to of like extreme scales, though, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, and it actually can help you create some really unique material properties and phases that it would be difficult to get otherwise. For instance, you can get a lot of amorphous phases just because of the amount of destruction that you do to the crystal structures, and even a lot of metastable phases that would be difficult to form otherwise. And a lot of that happens because you know, you're doing all this cold working, and then you're you're getting these really small quantities of material, right? These nanograins right next to one another yeah. in a damaged lattice. Yeah. All of a sudden, diffusion and other sorts of things that would be you know, much more spontaneous at a higher temperature, end up becoming possible. And so you can create some really interesting and unique materials this way that just would be incredibly difficult to otherwise. And I'm sure that impacts sintering as well. Like I think of like recovery, recrystallization, grain growth, right? We cover that in intro to MSC. We know that a more uh, damaged lattice has a higher strain, right? There's a strain energy that is embedded into that lattice the more defected it is and that increases your driving force that's a driving force for sintering right is it wants yeah, you to should lower your energy for sintering too. i would i would expect that you would see an impact on sintering as you increase the cold working in these things yeah and that's what that's what we've seen on a practical level where it's the we, we've done the pre-cryomill material so like a pre-alloyed and then we've cryomilled it and then we've seen how they sinter and it's it's very visible that the the cryoblum material actually centers at a lower temperature and for less time. Not so surprising. That's exactly what you're you're saying, and that makes a big deal. I mean, I w- we talked to a number of people in industry where there are a number of regulations actually on energy use that are coming down, especially oh, yeah. for some of our <laughs> EU guests. And if you can lower your temperature, that's a hundred degrees lower, lower temperature is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where the combination of the the specifically for us cryo milling. With SPS, which also has in some cases a ninety percent reduction in energy compared to uh, your traditional furnace sintering, that that really makes this technology uh, just all these things with green technology and, and energy efficiency is just it's right in line with that. Well, this has been a cool episode, um, Eric. While you're here, obviously, I have used you now at least two different times to help us out when we ran into problems. You've been a great resource, and I would gladly recommend you to our listeners. Is there a way they can get in touch with you if they have sintering or particle size reduction needs? Yeah. Uh, best way is probably go to our website. So that's uh, calnanocorp.com um, and uh, and reach out to us on our contact site. If you want to give us a call, our number is uh, 562 991 Five two one one, uh, yeah. Happy to talk to you about sintering, uh, particle size reduction, mechanical alloying, and uh, any other kind of crazy material science stuff you want to do. Very cool. All right, everybody. 
Thanks, as always, to the sponsors that make the show possible. We are very grateful to Materials Today from Elsevier. That's a journal which I think you should check out. <laughs> it's one of the good ones out there. It's actually one of the flagship ones, and if you care about impact factor and stuff like that. It's one of the better journals, and you can tell when you read their articles. They have good stuff, so we think you should check them out. We're also grateful to uh, you know the people that make the music for the show. That's Alphalot and Colobite. Thank you. And as always, I'm going to shamelessly tell you that you should go and give us a review. Go to iTunes, type it in, tell me how much you love to hear Andrew's sultry voice twice a month. You can't wait for it. It would actually do a lot for us to make sure that other people find this episode. We have been flirting with the number one spot in the chemistry category for months. We're right there. We're number two for long stretches. I think we can do it. Push us over that edge. Get those reviews. I want to be number one in the chemistry category. Okay. Thanks, everybody, as always, and we will see you next time. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>